All right. Welcome back, everybody, to another week of the Coffee with Nerds podcast. I am your host, Ryan Lecknoise. With me, as always, is my good friend and co-host, Alex. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Not too bad. So today, recently, I've had less work because my seasons are pretty much over now. So I've had more free time. And inevitably, what that means is I find more random things to just binge watch out of nowhere for no reason. Yeah. Last week or so, I decided to watch the entirety of the Big Hero 6 cartoon. Oh, the show. I've never seen the show. Yeah. So I hadn't seen it either. And I forgot there was a show. Yeah. The movie is pretty decent. I know it's, again, Big Hero 6 is based on a Marvel comic. It's not at all uh, like the yeah, Marvel comic, it's though. it's not. <laughs> it's completely different characters for the most the part. That's it, basically. And I guess kind of the powers. And I guess San Francisco is the similar setting. I mean, it's in Tokyo. It's just in Japan. Oh, it's just in Japan? Okay. In the comics, yeah. yeah. Like, I, I know the comics are completely, completely, completely different yeah. from the movie. It, again, but it's like their names and the powers. Yeah. Which is odd that they would... And even some of those are changed. Bring in a franchise and then just... Like, they didn't need to bring in the franchise is what my thought is. Yeah, not really. But regardless. So I started watching, and by started, I mean I finished watching the entire... I'm going to call it two and a half seasons of the show. So they have two seasons, and then the third season is 10 episodes, but it's like two-part episodes, if you know what I mean. Not like yeah. two episodes for one story, but two stories in one episode. Oh, okay. Like yeah. very broken like 10 up. 10-minute episodes, basically. Yeah, like it's 10-minute episodes, and it's nowhere near as good as the first two seasons. But It's a weird thing to change to. Yeah, my guess is the shelf life of shows, is especially cartoons, oh, yeah. is shows only like few three, years. three, four seasons max, because then the kids who are Usually. buying toys outgrow that. And then you have a SpongeBob that goes forever. But he doesn't sell toys. I know, toys. but that's the rarity. Um, I, SpongeBob sells lots of toys. Does he have toys? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Regardless, normally it's you target the kids who buy the toys. And when the kids are too old to be buying toys, yeah. you get rid of that and you start something new to target new kids to buy the toys and you cycle it through. So most cartoons only last about three to four seasons anyway. Yeah. So it's not like this got cut off. No, that's actually not that bad. Like, it, it did fine. If you had at, like I knew... I forgot there was a show. I knew they made a show, but if you had asked me, I would have guessed it was one season. No, it was about 60 episodes. Yeah. And again, for like 20, like 45 of them, 47, like the first two seasons are legit. like surprising that it was that long. Yeah, it was actually, it was quite good. It wasn't bad. But as I was watching it, it started to feel more and more familiar at first until I realized almost character for character, it's just the Teen Titans from the Teen Titans show. Okay. Across the board. And that got me thinking about what are some other familiar character archetypes that we see in TV and comics and stuff that we didn't highlight. Now, again, we have a previous episode talking about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and the four humors or the four temperaments yeah. and all that stuff. These are all, of course, going to be built around expanding on that knowledge. This is just like some more, I guess, detailed character types and archetypes that you might be familiar with. Yeah, especially, which is why I think this is so familiar, but especially in team settings, I think is where you see a lot of these because it seems to gel well. Yeah, because you want people to fill certain roles. Yeah. So if we look at the Teen Titans, that's probably like, and by that, I mean the the original good cartoon Teen Titans. Yeah. Because not like the comic book one, which is a different group mm -hmm. and not like, but that original Teen Titans run, the one that everybody loves. And I do mean everybody, Alex. Yeah. Everybody loves that, yourself included. Yeah. That's pretty much like the idyllic, idyllic team makeup for like a cartoon superhero team. And within that, you have some familiar archetypes that you will probably be able to, you'll probably be able to pick out your own oh, examples of these as we do them. Yeah. So most of this is going to be, I'm going to give examples from these, but okay. the more examples you can find as well, that would be great. Again, archetypes are fantastic because... They allow us to quickly introduce mm. audiences to that character so that we all have an understanding of that character from yeah, right away. Yeah, what their personality is going to be pretty much right away. Yeah, and then we can build on that with character development as things progress within the series mm -hmm. or books or whatever. Archetypes are fantastic if done properly. So let's start with the first archetype, which is probably the first two, I would say right now, are probably two of the more famous and widely used archetypes currently Okay, in a lot of like... I guess like preteen targeted shows. Okay. That makes sense. So the first one, again, this is definitely not the proper name for this term. This is just the proper name that I came up with. Some of them our buddy also mentioned, which I just kind of took from him. 
But the first one is like the black cat archetype or the too cool for school black t- black cat archetype. Okay. So think Raven from okay. Teen Titans. They're they're tough. They're smart. They're cold. They're straightforward. They're the introvert that doesn't need your help and most of the time doesn't really want it. Okay. I mean, to me though, she just she's also very similar to like. Uh, I guess she's not the hothead. I was gonna say she's kind of like Raphael from the Ninja Turtles, from like the one we already did. But. Well, again, like these archetypes are going yeah. to have the temperaments and the yeah. humors in them. So yeah, those are gonna come out. But again, these are more like if that's like the base level of yeah. archetypes. This is the next level. Okay. Of like here are some common combinations of the turtles. Okay. So Raven would be like that black cat archetype. Uh, Go Go and Big Hero Six, because that's the one I was just recently. Same idea. Yeah. But on top of that, you have somebody like Wednesday Adams. Okay. Wednesday Adams is another black cat archetype. Yeah. Right? Very logical, very straightforward, doesn't want friends, doesn't need friends, yeah. too cool for school sort of idea. Spinelli from Recess. Mm-hmm. Yes, I'm going back to Recess on this one. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Spinelli's in that same boat. And Batman would also kind of be a black cat archetype, which is funny because he's got Catwoman, but yeah, he's more of that like stern logical the super introvert sort of archetype yeah right so again these guys are this this archetype is often associated with dark and broody they don't kid around they don't really laugh they don't do much for emotions except kind of like frustration Mm -hmm. and maybe in the raven sent like outward anger when it comes to it but for the most part they don't really seem to have emotions yeah so i don't know can you think of any others i didn't mention that you would think would add to this list I mean, the one that I came to mind was like Rogue from the Evolution show. Yep. More so than the other shows. Yeah, from X-Men Evolution more so, yeah. but yeah, 100%. Um, I don't know. Off the top of my head, that's the only one I was... So as I was doing this, I was trying to think of the original X-Men team and who would fit where from this. I guess Wolverine would be that from the original Well, team. the original. Oh, I thought you meant like the first cartoon. I thought yeah. You the original cartoon. Let's talk about the very first X-Men I team. I mean, none of them really have that role no honestly. this one i would say probably doesn't fit there are a few that will become more apparent but like yeah yeah like this is this like is a, no one's like the broody angry one no because wolverine fills that role yeah and that's probably part of the why reason why wolverine became so popular is he did fill a vacant spot in that uh that archetypal yeah. place right most of them are i mean i feel like back in the 60s though that wasn't as common like i'm trying to think of other teams from around back then and like i mean scooby-doo there's not really one of them. Of the the black the, cats? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, I suppose. It's Even a newer like, one. This back is to like the original Avengers. This is certainly really a newer one for sure. Yeah. Uh, because there's even thoughts that I saw when looking this online that they gave it a different name, but like there was thoughts that like Eleven from Strangers Things was like a black cat archetype. Well, who would fit this mold a little bit? I guess. Doesn't emote that well, especially early seasons. Let's say early seasons. Yeah, but that's more just because like she doesn't. Yeah understand emotions yet. yep but yeah so this is one that i i've seen a good amount yeah it's it's uh, that really that that cool yeah stern tough kid and uh it moves into the second one because the second one is often associated with the black cat quite well and i list that as the ever positive golden retriever okay so everything is great yeah. everything is wonderful smell the flowers watch the butterflies smile 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 like the super extrovert that everybody knows and loves, who's yeah. everybody's best friend. Think Starfire. Oh, I thought you were going to say Beast Boy, but yeah, Starfire, yeah. Star, no, Beast Boy is another one. Starfire is the golden retriever. Yeah, like, no, that's, yeah. Hugs and kisses mm-hmm. and puppy dogs for everybody. Mm-hmm. Honey Lemon in Big Hero 6 takes that role. Uh, Enid from Wednesday. I don't really haven't seen it, but Enid is her roommate who is essentially yeah. hugs and kisses and rainbows and bright colors. and Mikey from Recess. Mikey. Mikey's a different one. I mean, he would probably be that, though, for their group, too. No one else would fit that archetype. They don't all fit into all of them. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, but I'm just saying he would probably fit that. Well, Mikey would be is the I next know he's group. Like, yeah, he's got all the poetry and all that stuff, too. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll get to the next group. But Mikey is not a bad choice. Yeah. But I also put, like, uh, have you seen BoJack Horseman? Nope. Well, Mr. Peanut Butter, who is a golden Labrador, yeah. is clearly picked to be a golden Labrador for the same idea. But, like, yes, he is yeah. like that. Everything is great everything's fun let's all be fun and i put clark kent not superman clark yeah. kent and the reason for that is because of the complete contrast between these character types mm-hmm. between the black cat and golden retriever they tend to be paired together yeah and they tend to associate well together hawk and dove could almost be like this but they're they're a little bit different but either way it's the idea that opposites attract yeah and when they're not fighting crime 
and Batman and Superman are just kind of hanging out. So when Bruce Wayne and Clark yeah. Kent are just super hanging out, Clark Kent is very much a golden retriever. Mm-hmm. Hey, let's have fun sort of idea. Lighten up. And Bruce Wayne is still like the dude. My parents are dead and I haven't gotten yeah. over it, even though it was like 70 years ago at this point. Yeah. Whatever. Money can't buy happiness. It can just buy cars and jets and batarangs, all that stuff. But yeah. So you, I feel like this one is familiar for like just that, that hyper optimistic character. Yeah. Now you mentioned Mikey from Recess. He falls into my next category, which this one is, I, I did... When I found one with a proper name, I included both of them. I call this the teddy bear, but it's also known as the gentle giant. Okay. Which is, it's that really big and yeah. imposing and yeah, yeah. physically intimidating presence who has also would never hurt a fly mm-hmm. and is the sweetest, most gentle human thing in the life. Mm-hmm. Obviously, Mikey from Recess is the gentle giant. Yeah. Obviously, the iron giant is yeah. probably the most famous example of a gentle giant. Yeah. But I also included Beast from X-Men in this one. Yeah, somewhat, I he, guess. He's 100% a gentle giant. I mean, he's not that big, it would be my thing. I mean, if he wanted to be large and intimidating as a monster, he could be. Yeah. That's the idea. Like, he's still a large... It's less stature-wise, as yeah. much as stature is important, but like presence-wise mm-hmm. sort of thing. Like, he's he's an imposing presence. He's a scary-ass monster. Yeah. But he's a pure pacifist, right? Kind of? No. He used to be. No. Yeah. He's not a pacifist. He still fights and everything. In this, okay. So in X Men '96, the old one, he is a pacifist at the Maybe start. I don't remember that? But they make it clear because he gets arrested and he goes to jail. I remember he gets arrested and goes to jail. But I don't yeah, know. and he accepts it and he just reads his book. But I mean, and he then... still fights bad guys. So he's not a pacifist. Does he in the old show? Yeah, Sentinel's not including because robots are different. I don't know if he actually. I'm sure he fights, but I don't know if he hurts people though. I'm sure he fights people but i don't know if he hurts people i mean arguably none of them are really shown to like hurt hurt people in the old cartoon no but like i'm pretty sure in all of his fights he's like grabbing guns and breaking them but he's not like physically assaulting i don't know i'm betting he like throws someone or something at some point because that's really all they show them to do they like they weren't even allowed to throw punches so that's the thing is they were probably forced into that because his power doesn't present itself in another way he can really fight because they weren't allowed to punch people. That's true. That is weird that they weren't allowed to punch kids people. Show. I get it. It's a kid right? show. So it's like someone like Cyclops can shoot lasers because a kid can't do that. You don't know. Well, no, but you know what I mean? So it's like they can't, they probably didn't really have Beast doing a lot of physical stuff because of that. So you're right. He probably does like take weapons and break. He does a lot of, he does a lot of taking weapons and break. But I think he's, I'm pretty sure mentions in the show know, early on. Regardless, definitely not part of his character in the comics. Yeah. But that's the idea of the gentle giant. And they fill that role in the team of kind of like the other role that's another one that I think the teddy bear kind of works along as well is like the caregiver archetype. Yeah. Which is originally called like the mother archetype, but like, yeah. you know, team team daddy, team mom. Yeah. Sort of thing like that. Cyborg in the Teen Titan show would be the teddy bear. He's yeah. bigger. He's imposing, but he's still super nice and kind and all that mm-hmm. stuff and less pacifist than most because he does, you know, booyah and punching and stuff like that. Yeah. But. Yeah, so the gentle giant is a proven archetype that yeah. that has come up a lot, and there are plenty of examples of that as well. Uh, a few others that I that I didn't mention because we're talking about the parallels between Teen Titans and uh, Big Hero Six. I'll mention that Wasabi in the Big Hero Six stuff would be the gentle giant teddy bear type archetype. Okay, yeah. he's a big. He looks like a big strong person, and then less so in the movie because the movie again it's very short, and they don't give him a lot of screen time to do yeah. anything. But like in the show, they make him like. He's a germaphobe. He's a neat freak. He's scared of everything. Like he literally has fears of everything. Yeah. Despite him being the most physically dominant looking one of the group, right? Mm-hmm. Physically imposing one. Uh, Chewbacca would be a gentle giant. Yeah. Yeah. This was the example given from the website I found that had Chewbacca listed. Chewbacca is 100% a gentle giant. Yeah. Sure, he fights. Yeah. But he fights in very specific things. And most of the time, like, he's a nice person. We never. Oh, we do see him rip arms off a robot. We see that happen in Solo. Up to that point, we never see him rip arms off a robot, despite Han implying that he can. Yeah. But yeah, so that's... See him that's shoot people. <laughs> he does shoot people. He shoots a lot of people. Yeah. But in general, like, again, these yeah, archetypes yeah. are just base role. You know from looking at Chewbacca, he's that mm-hmm. nice, fluffy teddy bear sort of thing yeah. who just goes along, Root. I guess, with whoever owns the Millennium Falcon. It's just his owner or something. I never understood that part. No, he, he goes with Han because he owes him a life debt. 
Yeah, and then Han dies, and he just said, well, I guess I'll oh. just stick with Rey on the Millennium Falcon. Well, then I guess he's just like, these are my friends now. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, why not? I mean, I've met other people over the hundreds of years I've been alive, but, you know, I'll just stick with these guys. Yeah. I'll just go with Rey, who I met for, like, three seconds, and then my best friend dies. Well, they're so. going to find Luke. He knows Luke. Yeah, he also knows Leia. <laughs> yeah. Unless he's there to bridge the gap. Maybe. So when Luke shows up, and he's all like, who does the he hell? even interact with Luke? I'm trying to remember. I don't like, think he stays he does. at the ship for most of I really of it. don't think he does, which is a weird choice in that movie. Because again, you would think there'd be a great scene of Luke talking to Chewbacca and being like, how's it going? What's Han up to? Oh shit, I'm sorry. I didn't know that. That must be rough yeah. for you. Instead, he's just like, you wait in the ship. Yeah. You don't need to talk to your I mean, friend. he doesn't interact with Leia either after Han dies, even though you think they could definitely like commiserate over that. I know, that's His what ex-wife I mean. and best friend. He just, he he is the property of whoever has the Falcon. Yeah. He just lives with the owner of the Falcon. Well, maybe he owns the Falcon now and she asked for a ride. Oh, that's a, that's a thought. Yeah. Who's, I mean, he probably does own the Falcon now. Lando might own the Falcon now. I'm trying to think in episode nine, the one that everyone tries to forget, who is piloting the Falcon in the end battle. And I think it's Lando. Maybe. I think it's Lando and Chewie. I'm sure it's Chewbacca. I'm sure he's at least the co-pilot. He better be. The man fought in three wars, damn it. (laughs) Three wars. I've ranted about this before, but three goddamn wars. They didn't even get a medal. He gave him one at the end of this one. I know. It was a pity medal. They gave it to him in the background when everyone else is not paying attention. Get him set in fr- like front and center. So just that's one of my favorite lines from an old internet video, one of the old college humor ones where that's like someone watching Star Wars for the first time. And he's like, I didn't like it. They're like, what? You didn't like it? It's like, why? It's like, well, first of all, their bipedal dog friend didn't get a medal. So that's crap. Yep. <laughs> it's Which, just like, it is so good. Because, you, you know, the end of episode four, we're getting on a bit of a tangent, but I'm yeah. okay with that. The end of episode four, it ends with Chewie giving like the sort of thing. Yeah. I think that's him asking for his <laughs> medal. Like, yeah. what? <laughs> I was there. Yeah. Like, who do you think was flying the Millennium Falcon when Han shot that guy? Just because I don't speak English doesn't mean I don't get a medal. <laughs> like, that's bullshit. Inclusivity. Inclusivity. I yeah. fought just as hard as these guys did. This is racist. Super racist. Speciest. Yeah. Speciest. Yeah. Maybe they only had two medals. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Maybe they had two medals and Han's like, look, if I don't get a medal, <laughs> I ain't helping you out anymore. I'm leaving to go get Jabba. And Luke's yeah. like, well, I'm the guy who actually did it. So like, okay, you two get it. And then Chewie's argument was like, I don't fucking care. Yeah. <laughs> ah, I love Chewbacca. Underrated character. All right. Next one. The wild card, also known as the Jester archetype. Charlie Day. <laughs> from Charlie Day yeah. is absolute wild card. <laughs> yes. But he would be one of them. But this is also like your beast boy. Yeah. This is the character that is as 100% mikey from turtles as they get Mm -hmm. they love to laugh they love to make other people laugh they deliberately try to make jokes they do everything to lighten the mood they are as far from serious as humanly possible yeah that's what their character is sometimes they're the bumbling buffoon who is just they're not ha ha funny on purpose they are look at this idiot stepping on rakes funny yeah that's charlie from always sunny (laughs) yeah charlie from always sunny you have fred from big hero six is this way yeah um shaggy Shaggy would be in this archetype. Scooby-Doo. Yep. Uh, Iceman from the X-Men, I yeah. figure, would be in yeah, this. Yeah, if we were talking the original ones. Yeah, yeah he's, he's the jokester. Even in general, yeah. He's the jokester of the bunch. That's how he's always played him out to be. Like, you need comedic, like, you need somebody to bring yeah. comedy in almost anything. So yeah. this is why it's such a prominent archetype. What I found really interesting about this archetype when I was kind of thinking about this and talking about it to myself and just going over the points here is it's always like a secondary character in Western superheroes or comics or media or something like that right like this yeah. boy's not the leader of anything Iceman's not the leader of anything charlie is very clearly not the leader of their group yeah but it's almost like this is a very prominent character archetype in manga and it tends to be the protagonist like the luffy luffy is a jester character goku's goku. a jester character naruto is a jester character and those are like the names in manga yeah like but the way they work it for manga which i thought was interesting is manga characters, in my opinion, especially these old shonen Saito hero archetypes, they're essentially two different characters in one body. So yeah, Luffy is a jester 90% of the time. That's the one side of the coin. But then when things get serious, the coin flips and they're a completely different character who mm. just happens to look at it and they're just they're that dedicated, you know, responsible, you're never gonna beat me. I need to protect all these people. Obviously Goku was the first like this. Yeah. Even Aang, actually, when I think about that, which is like not technically an anime, but is very anime inspired. 100% 
anime and manga inspired. But yes, he falls in that same boat yeah. of like, I'm, well, Soka would probably be the jester in that situation. Yeah. But I don't know. Aang's they a similar boat. Are, yeah. Aang's a similar boat. We're like, yeah, he's a fully a, a, the jester archetype. But yeah. then when things get serious, they flip into mm -hmm. the serious archetype. And I think that's how manga works in a lot of these traditional ones. And I think the reason behind that is relatability with their target audience. Yeah. Kids love yeah, for Goku sure. and Luffy and Naruto because they're funny and they're like kids and they act like kids. Yeah. But you can't have that in a serious fighting moment. Mm -hmm. So they throw that flip coin in where... Well, once Goku gets serious, there's no more jokes or anything like that. It's all business. Yeah. Once Luffy gets serious, there's no more. Like, it's all business. Whereas somebody like Spider-Man is almost like... He's joking the whole time. He's joking the entire time sort of thing, which we, we see that, like, again, I don't know if it makes them better or worse characters. It's just a different yeah, take. It's just, different. it's just a different take on these flips. I just thought it was interesting when I was thinking about this, that, like, there are, there are a lot of gesture archetypes in manga, but they're never fully 100% the gesture. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that Beast Boy doesn't get serious from time to time, mm. but it's yeah. a very different extent to serious, yeah. right? So yeah, I, I mentioned that like some characters use this archetype like a switch that they turn on and off for non-serious and serious moments because it's hyper-relatable for kids. And it tends to be why these tend to be kids' favorites. Mm. I'm sure if you ask most eight-year-olds who their favorite turtle is, it's probably going to be Michelangelo. Yeah, a lot of the time. I'm sure you could go down the list if we were to introduce them to all of this stuff, and they would probably pick the goofy, silly, yeah, bumbling sure. buffoon type of kid. So yes, that's the wild card or the jester archetype. That's that, you know, the fun one. Yeah. Everyone likes the fun one. And then the last one I thought of was like the Boy Scout bald eagle type. I mean, that's just the leader. It's the leader. Though, which we already did. Yeah. Because that's Leonardo. It's, yeah, it's straight up. It's because you the, need the leader. You do need the leader. And the leader has to be, you know. A little more serious. And, yeah. But this one is also like the, the Boy Scout archetype is also a little bit more than that. Because it's like for justice and yeah. do the right thing at all costs. And like yeah. pure Boy Scout mode. Like we're talking. It's just the good leader. Yeah. We're talking 50s. You could have a bad guy leader too. Yeah. We're talking 50s Superman here. Like yeah. the very traditional. Yeah. It's wrong to jaywalk sort of type of character, right? But uh, they always do the right thing. They always protect the right people in the right yeah. place. And they're often, they're the leaders of the group. They can be stern and stoic. Hence, like, Robin from Teen Titans yeah. would be this type of thing. But they're still very much in charge. And they always try to make the right decisions and do mm. the right things. And all they care about is making sure that they have made the right decisions that lead to the right things. And that's where we get Superman, Captain America. Cyclops is obviously this yep. sort of leader archetype. Uh, the other half of Naruto, Goku, and Luffy. So not the wild card half, but the hey, yeah, this fight's going to happen. I need to make sure you don't blow up this planet for the third time. Yeah, Earth only blows up once in Dragon Ball. Dragon Ball, I don't know. I think it blows up. No, actually, I don't think it blows up ever. Again, I watched like a season and a half of Dragon Ball Z and that's it. So. Yeah, I'm pretty sure to Goku's many failings, most of which as a father, Yeah, I think he successfully protects the Earth from exploding at all times. There you go. They never like blows up and they use the Dragon Balls to fix it. They almost, it almost blows up. Like, Boo kills everybody on Earth. Okay. But I don't... So, I mean, it basically blew up. But uh, yeah, I don't think... It may as well have blown up. It, it might as well. Like, I'm trying to remember if he kills everybody by blowing up Earth or if he just kills the majority of them and then they use the Dragon Balls to bring, like, everybody yeah. back. But the Earth itself, like, Namek explodes. Yeah. Vegeta blows up a planet in, like, episode four. He just yeah. two fingers that bug planet and, you know, goes boom. Which begs the question, how big was that bug planet? I don't know. Because Frieza, a being far, far stronger than Vegeta at the time, gave <laughs> Namek like 10 minutes, which in, in anime times is like four months. Yeah, that's like 12 episodes. Yeah, like he gave it 10 minutes to destroy that when Vegeta literally just looked at a planet and went, two fingers, gone. Maybe it was just a weak planet. That's what I mean. Was it like a moon? I mean, maybe it wasn't small. It was just weak <laughs> physically. Just physically weak. It was empty. <laughs> <laughs> it was a big hollow planet. <laughs> That's possible. Well, yeah, so that's that's the bald eagle Boy Scout archetype. So essentially what I wanted to do today is because I found that Big Hero 6 and the Teen Titans like like watch the show, I would recommend, and you'll see like, holy shit, this is just the same team. Like almost cut and paste, different powers sort of thing, but like you can see all of this. And then that got me to, to thinking about the Black Cat archetype, which... Obviously, Wednesday Adams got really popular when her series came out, mm -hmm. which, you know, I'm, I know they're working on the second season. Actually, I think the second season's starting soon. I don't know. I haven't heard anything about it, so it's probably not starting soon. Maybe not. Either way, I know they're working on the second season. There's no way it's not. It was too popular. 
And that led into that idea of like, well, Enid's also that golden retriever, happy-go-lucky archetype, which follows this role. Yeah. Okay. And so then let's examine the other archetypes that we have in these shows and see how prominent they are in other forms of media. And of course, because they're archetypes and because the people who write these shows and these characters are smart and know how to write, and they understand that you start with an archetype and you expand from there, yeah. and that's how you character develop in an effective way, then of course they're going to have similarities across the board and they're all going to fall into these roles. So yeah. That's uh, that's what I had for these ones. Again, less of a less of an in depth look as it was in the turtles episode because the turtles episode we had a lot more to explain. We had to explain what these stereotypes and archetypes were and how yeah. they work. This one was more so just highlighting a few of the more common ones that you might see, especially in mm-hmm. the more nerd culture centered shows like yeah. a superhero show, a manga, or you know. I, I consider Wednesday Adams to be a nerd culture show. It's not really. It was general pop culture, I'd say. Uh, yeah, but you know what I mean. Like, it's. Yeah. These don't really apply to, like, your high dramas. Yeah. Or your crime shows too much. Yeah. They might in some cases, but not normally. Mm. But they do apply in these, like, these preteen aimed cartoons mm-hmm. and shows like that. And Wednesday is still very much a preteen aimed show. Yeah. So, yeah. Just thought I would. Uh, Highlight a few of these, get some discussion about them, see what you thought, see if you agreed or if you had any other examples. I'm glad that you brought up uh, the Always Sunny because Always Sunny is great. Well, I mean, he yells out wild card in the one episode. <laughs> he does. Because he cut the brakes and then jumps out of the car. Oh, uh, he might be like the best character in TV. He's pretty good. It's up there. But I was also thinking like a lot of these archetypes you could somewhat apply to like even friends follow some of these like phoebe's kind of like yeah, the I mean, wild card character like, that like yeah it's how archetypes work but there are different ones based on different forms of media if that mm-hmm. makes sense like these ones play very well for preteen audiences the friends archetypes play more for sitcom yeah variations. i mean i think in general like, a lot of the stuff you were talking about was cartoons and stuff too where it's like things are more exaggerated yes this was definitely cartoon focus and right. emphasized but yes things are definitely more exaggerated but even still like friends is notoriously bad for stereotypes and archetypes yeah and they've made those and, and by bad i mean like it, every yeah everyone yeah. fits stereotypes and everybody stuff, yeah. very heavily fits in they all get very flanderized thing. by the end yep yep that's how that's how it is so yeah. not a bad thing just want to highlight a few of them hopefully you guys at home enjoyed this little conversation a little bit uh if you've seen the big hero six show and the teen titan show let me know in the comments if you guys think they're the exact same show but with different plot lines and storylines And if not, I recommend you give them a shot. I think Big Hero 6 was okay. And I think the Teen Titans classic cartoon, if you haven't seen it, what are you doing? Yeah. Stop this. Classic. Go watch it. It's the best. It's it's by far my favorite superhero cartoon. I know it's not yours. It's my favorite, but it's up there. It's it's up there for sure. Like, it's really good. So if you haven't seen that one, absolutely go and find a way to watch that. I don't even know where you can watch it now. I don't know. I don't know. It's probably somewhere. I mean, you can probably buy it at the very least. Yeah, I think... Is it on the DC thing in the States? I don't know. Because I don't think it's available in Canada where we where we are situated yeah, I don't know. on any streaming service. If it would be, it'd probably be Crave because that's where all the HBO and WB stuff comes here. But okay. Anyway, thank you for listening. Alex, any final words before we say goodbye? Nope. All right. Well, I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of your day. All right.